on the opposite end of the spectrum. You could pull together all the information on religious mysticism and how that relates to DMT experiences and alien abduction encounters and you could go any direction you want with this because I believe that a lot of these things, if not all these things, are very intimately related. Welcome back. I'm here again with Chase Williams. Chase, welcome back, my friend. Hey, Sean. Glad to be back. All right. In the last episode, you were going into some of the work you were doing in analyzing a lot of the reports that are out there in the literature. So if you could just tell us about that. Yeah. So in my own research endeavors, I want to try to be unbiased as much as I can, especially given the experiences that I've shared with you and your audience. So in an effort to do so, but also just because I find it fascinating you know, I want to look for all the academic research on the nature of consciousness, on near-death experiences, extrasensory perception, UFOs, all of it, to try and get a really well-rounded education, of at least what exists, you know, and, and understand the various hypotheses and theories that exist on this stuff. And in doing so, I realized that there was this big gap in how we get the information that we get, because a lot of this information comes from the anecdotal evidence. And anecdotal evidence isn't really considered that great in academia and the scientific community, unless you have a lot of it and you're able to validate statistical significance, basically. Right, right. That's right. So, you know, in an effort to do that, capture all of the anecdotal reports, you know, there's so much that's overlooked. Think about you make a video on your NDE experience on YouTube, and then you have a thousand comments of people and maybe 200 people saying, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine, right? Same thing for Reddit, same thing for all these forums, all these websites, Facebook, all the social networks. There's a ton of videos on TikTok. It's everywhere. So you've got this wealth of information out there. And sure, you have the question of, Establishing validity, like how do you know validi- somebody's right. just not making right. something up just to because they want to be heard or whatever for whatever reason, right. whatever motivation. That's right. Yeah, and, and and you know if you're interested in putting this kind of evidence, anecdotal evidence, into a formal research paper or submitting it to a journal, then there are additional steps you have to go through. You have to be able to prove that you know you know more about your source of information, the, the individuals that are reporting these things, than you typically would if you were just clipping these, scraping them off the internet, right? So there's a lot to to think about and account for there. I am working with the Free Foundation and Ray Hernandez. Free is the Dr. Edgar Mitchell's foundation for researching extraordinary and extraterrestrial stuff. It's now called something else. I've forgotten the name of it, but they've rebranded it, renamed it. But These are a lot of academics and PhDs that have had really similar experiences to the things that I shared with you on the last episode. And there's another aspect of this where it's just fascinating that there are all these PhDs that have had these crazy experiences that are really honestly trying to explain this stuff and integrate it into their disciplines and their hypotheses. So that's another aspect and another hurdle from a research perspective is this is very interdisciplinary. This isn't just physics. This isn't just physiology, right? This is everything. This is everything. When the United States and China clash, the world will never be the same, especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? Tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. So it would be ideal if you had a database that had all of this information in it, 
that was highly responsive, highly organized, and very diverse as far as what disciplines it can serve. And so that's what I've been developing. It's called Paradox, discoverparadox.com. That's P-A-R-A-D-O-C-S dot com to learn more. The beta has not been released yet, but hopefully in a month or two, that'll go out. And the way that this is going to be structured is everything that's within the databases that we have unstructured and structured databases is very complex, a lot of moving parts, a lot of variables to account for. So this is a really involved process. But the database itself and all the information in it, it will be free to anyone. But then there are going to be tiers above that where you have more visualization features, you're able to access the integrated AI more to utilize that to navigate through the database or help develop a hypothesis or a theory or collaborate. There's collaborative workspace on the back end as well. So if you have a podcast, you want to do research for a show, right? Those kinds of things, all of that can be done. Or if you want to write a formal academic paper, you can do that on the back end as well. So so that's paradox in a nutshell. You know, the sheer volume, the magnitude of the information that's out there, I think escapes many people. Having conversations with the Free Foundation and Ray and Dr. Long and Grant Cameron, who's a good friend of mine, you know, when somebody gets a list of 15,000 things, they think it's a lot. 15,000 things is nothing, right? We have over 10 million reports right now, and we've only been researching. I have one desk researcher now, a dedicated desk researcher, and she's been doing this for two months. We've got 10 million things. So how does she do it? She just plugs websites into like a scraper? Uh, it depends, right? Some websites have their own API for scraping and stuff. Other times, I'll develop something in Python to scrape. Even then, I think there are other things that we use. But her main job is just to identify the sources, which are pretty open to the sources. I don't want to be biased. So it's the skeptics and the believers together, all the information, all the historical information that's available, it's pulled in. And yeah, we have processes running in the background that look at the source, and then either we develop Python script for that, or we integrate an API or some other various method to get that information. And then it has to be integrated into the database. It has to be structured in a way if it's going into the structured database, or even if it's the unstructured, we have to still have to structure it a bit to put it into the NoSQL database. And then it has to be integrated with the AI. So as it gets uploaded into the databases, it's also getting integrated into the large language model. And so think chat GPT level of ability, but completely trained on everything that's available, all the anecdotal evidence, all the academic evidence, everything that's out there. That's the intent is to completely train this to help us formulate hypotheses and theories and to see interdisciplinarily across disciplines so that you know, a physicist might not be thinking about the psychological aspects of an experience. So we want to make sure that we're looking at the sphere from all angles. Yeah. And then from a user's perspective, how would they use it? Would they just go in and would yeah. they, how many near-death experiences have occurred in the last eight years in the United States in this state? Is that like yeah. a legitimate query and then the AI looks for it? Absolutely. So that could be one way a user could use it. I want this to be very easy to use, a very, very user-friendly, and I want it to be something that appeals to the individual experiencer or somebody that's just curious, and also all the way up to the professional academic or somebody that's writing their thesis or something like that. So I want it to appeal to both. You can use the AI to run queries like that. And the information is structured in such a way and the LLM is trained on that information in such a way that, you know, a query like the example you gave, Sean, would immediately spit out uh, an answer. I mean, in 10 seconds, you'd have your answer. You know, you'd know what percentage of those experiences we knew occurred in Texas or around Houston or wherever. And you could dig deeper to determine the sources of those reports and try to determine the confidence level of those reports, whether the AI is ranked one report as high confidence and another report as low confidence and why. So all of that's built into the system. Or on the opposite end of the spectrum, you could 
pull together all the information on religious mysticism and how that relates to DMT experiences and alien abduction encounters. And you could go any direction you want with this, because I believe that a lot of these things, if not all these things, are very intimately related. To advertise on Through a Glass Darkly, email throughglassdarkly ads at gmail.com. I don't think there's this massive separation between someone having a ghost experience and someone having an alien abduction experience. I think at the very least, they're very, both of them are very peculiar and seem to be outside of what we accept and consider to be normal. Base reality, right. Base reality. Right. But, you know, I don't want to digress into my own opinions here, but that's the reason why paradox and the structure behind the schema that kind of runs the databases and the AI is so multifaceted. I think the last time I looked at the schema, we had something like four or 500 nodes off of nine or 10 main categories, you know, so think natural experiences, induced experiences, the nature of perception itself. We want to look at what academia and the medical field, how do they try to explain perception and what are the, mm-hmm. the physiological characteristics of a, a perception out of the rods and cones work, yada, 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 right? What is the brain doing? We want to integrate all of that information into the database, not only so that the AI can be well-informed and understand, but also so that the users and those that are inputting queries can really dig deep and understand these things more holistically. What about geolocating different things? You know, as an example, could you put in a query like map all UFO sightings from this time period and correlate that with nuclear sites, you know, either military or civilian? Absolutely. Is that something that would do? It could actually do that? And that's already a feature that's on the back end. I was trying to bring something up. I don't think it, we have it on the Discover Paradox site. You can go to the Discover Paradox site and click about us and explore. And there are a couple of explanatory things there, but I don't think we have a snapshot of that. But yeah, the most advanced mapping system for the phenomenon anywhere that I've seen is also an aspect of paradox. So, you know, military installations, right? Nuclear sources, all the sightings that you would expect to find in New Fork or MUFON's databases, and then everything else that's been scraped and uh, procured from the web as well, and from physical text. So that's stage two. After we scrape the web, obviously that's an ongoing process because the web is continually growing as well. But after that has more or less been completed and we go into just keeping up with the web. Parallel to that effort, we're also integrating all books, everything that's in print that isn't available digitally, we're digitizing and putting in as well. I know there are some other organizations around the world, one particularly in Sweden now, Norway, Norway, I think, not Sweden, and they're digitizing their physical libraries. But again, I haven't seen anybody do anything quite this extensive and i what haven't seen a new what about the newspaper clippings like the newspaper services oh, yeah. that are you know, oh so you're absolutely that too absolutely yeah have you spoken to richard geldrich at all no that doesn't sound familiar um, okay i can connect you after he's yeah he's that'd be great working on something similar primarily through there's like a hatch data if you're familiar with that um, hatch data yeah yeah there's another UFO researcher back in the 90s that was using like MS DOS and oh. and tabulating all this stuff. But he also integrates newspaper clippings and he's subscribed to a service and he's using AI to do similar stuff. But his is almost entirely UFO related. But yeah, yeah, the newspapers uh, absolutely are integrated and a, and a part. Now, there are a couple of sources of those that have already been digitized. But yeah, you know, this is a massive endeavor. You know, I just, yeah. just, to, I mean, it's, it sounds like you've made a huge, huge amount of headway so far. Though. Oh, yeah, we have. Absolutely. Yeah. The back end looks great. The dashboard's pretty much done. Um, you know, and there are also integrated AI automations for user convenience. So, you know, if you want to look for emergent patterns and trends and specific data sets that you build from the database, so you pull it up, 
you can look through the database. You can go, okay, I don't care about any of that stuff. I just want to look at people that have experienced floating carrots, if that's the thing. So you, you do the floating carrots and then you say, okay, tell me, you know, let's look for emergent patterns, you know, and it'll say, yeah, sure. It turns out that everybody that or 90% of the people that see floating carrots also see floating cucumbers. I don't know. Right. So there are you some down, interesting- download the data in like Excel, things like that. If you want to show charts. And- <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's not going to be locked or, or anything like that. Anything that we're concerned about copyright infringement or anything like that, all the legal late work happens before that goes live to the users. And then additionally, there will be some precautions there, legal language for users if they want to recreate things. But yeah, there, you'll be able to download anything you want. You can download the whole database, but I don't think anybody's going to want to do that because right now, big. I think we're in the terabytes right now, I'm pretty sure, low terabytes. But our initial projections were when we went live, we'd be somewhere around 40 or 50 terabytes And this includes pictures too, you know, there's not even a source you can go to and look at all the UFO pictures that have ever been taken. Google is a thing, but Google is flawed in how users search for things and what keywords or phrases are used, you know, and how long a site has been live and how it's ranked. So, you know, you're going to miss a lot. And I think most casual people that use the internet know that, you're going to find things on Facebook. You're going to find things on TikTok that you don't generally find on Google with a similar query. And so, you know, this database is intended to simplify that process for the user, right? If I want to look at all of the pictures that have ever been published, inclusive of all illustrations of circular craft in the United States or in Australia or wherever globally, I can put that query in and immediately have all those pictures right in front of me. Right. All information is out on the web anyway. It's just how do we grab it and how do we show it to the user? Yep. Yep. All right. Well, here's a bizarre use case. Tell me how this might handle it. Okay. Let's say I have a hypothesis that, again, I'm just making this up. This is not my real hypothesis, that multiple species have visited the earth in various waves and that they're typically associated with different craft. So let's say I ask the AI, AI, can you go through the different types of non-human species reported and their association with various craft, okay? And based on that data set, can you develop a hypothesis for the cause of the waves and whether or not there were conflicts that resulted in them visiting and then stop visiting and and then just develop a hypothesis basically weave a story absolutely do that absolutely yeah and it would take a whole minute and a half (laughs) if that probably 45 seconds yeah i don't think people realize the transformative power of it i mean most people are afraid of it and i can understand that but i don't think they realize the transformative Oh, it's it. like, I'm just, I'm just, yeah. I'm way behind you, but I'm just beginning to, yeah. I mean, we're dealing with like financial aid stuff with my son. Like, yeah, you just say, Hey, look, here's the situation. Here's what I make. Write a very nice letter asking for more. Yeah. And it's just like, bloom. And it's yeah, like, I, you change one word and it's perfect. Yeah. Like stuff I tell that you, you just what, don't have time to do. It's just like waste of time stuff. That's it's important. In, it's incredible. It's incredible how efficient and versatile it's become because it used to be, we couldn't do this stuff five years ago. This was not available, you know, and the onset of AI, honestly, the addition of AI to the Paradox platform was kind of an afterthought because it's become such a huge portion of it, but it's so powerful and it's able to consider these various aspects, interdisciplinary aspects that most individuals are not going to be able to consider, at least not that quickly. But yeah, I agree with you. When it comes to mundane stuff, I have a story. I've got the chat GPT app on my iPhone, right? Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if you've seen it. And if you're a subscriber, you can- I am talk- absolutely. So I use Dolly. Okay. I love it. I love it. Okay. So have you tried the 4 aught model, the new- the newest? No, it's brand new. It came, it's like two, three days old, right? Right, Something right. Like you, you, I, you I have not switch, tried it yet. You can switch to it on the app. Yeah. But here's the thing. I used it- A week ago, we moved to this new house, right? I get fiber internet because we work from home. And I noticed that the wave propagation is not 
what I want for the devices that are on the other end of the house. So as we would do prior, I think about, well, I want to do a comparison of various routers to see what's best. I just ask the AI. I say, here's the house. Here's the layout, right? Give me a list of products. Tell me why. I want you to specifically look at user reviews, right? And look for users that are talking about comparable sized homes, right? And the same kind of concerns for the wave propagation. And it took me a minute and I had my answer and I knew exactly what router to buy. Best bang for the buck. And I didn't have to do any other research myself. Chase, I use it to write legal contracts. Oh, yeah, me too. <laughs> I, you know, I'm like, I'll, I'll go in and like, yeah. you know, yeah. I don't just take whatever it's out, it. sure. but like yeah. I'll revise yeah. it. But I'm like, I don't, yeah. just for folks, you know, yeah. listening and trying to record every word so that I can break regulations and that I do not offer legal advice. It's just for my own yeah. thing. But it, it is what it's I think amazing. is going to happen is yeah. I think that people like you and I who are independent consultants, mm-hmm. contractors, it is going to open up. Oh, yeah. And people who are still kind of in the nine to five gig, five years from now, they're not going to know what hit the corporations because corporations are going to start to have to compete with these individuals yeah. who just have all this access and they're going to be stuck in their inertia. Yeah. I mean, they're already stuck they're- in the inertia of all these commercial rental contracts that they have that. You know, they're they're integrating it now. You know, I tell you, I, um, Oh, I know w- I can tell one, you a whole story about that. Yeah. One of the companies I was consulting for last year, I'm not going to put their name out yeah, here, yeah, but yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll say they're in the automotive space. They're in the emerging technology automotive space. Very well known, especially in the U S and my role with that organization, I'm supporting it was mostly operational and functional safety. I have a lot of experience in automotive tech and operational functional safety is kind of especially when it comes to instrumentation and control systems. But as you can imagine, in a role like that, there's a significant amount of time that's spent every week developing presentations to take to the CX level, right? And that amount of time was cut down by 80% with AI. I would tell the AI, I'm developing presentation, here's the information, and it would give me Everything that I needed, I'd have to make a few revisions, but you know, you, you're. <laughs> it wouldn't do a PowerPoint for you, though, right? It would just, it would just oh. tell you what to put on each slide, right? Well, it's, yeah, it builds the content for you, you know, all the content based on your information. David and Morehouse and I, I was just, yeah. I was showing him Chat GPT. You know who David Morehouse is? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I was just showing him Chat GPT. It's just like, can it do like a remote viewing syllabus? I'm like, well, oh, let's yeah. try. Yeah. And it's just like, bloop. And he's just like, <laughs> holy shit, that's pretty good. He says, not perfect, but that's right. a pretty good yeah. start. Yeah. So, yeah, I think part yeah. of it is just trying to actively find better ways to, yeah. to use in your life to be able to utilize this stuff. So, I mean, I'm slowly, slowly kind of coming up to speed with it, but it is yeah. really transformative if you use it yeah. in the right ways. And Absolutely. I think it's going to make small business owners. Mm-hmm much 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 more productive in a way that it, these a lot of these corporations don't, or any other corporations are just trying to adopt it no matter what now the other thing that the dark side of it is we're going to reach a power an energy crisis we're going to have like an energy crisis in about 18 months because mm-hmm. these things these gpus just suck energy and then you have crypto, which also does the same thing. Oh, man, I was mining Ethereum for a couple of years. And let me tell you guys, everybody was complaining about GPU prices. I was buying 3x retail price, and I was still doing pretty well. I sold them all. But yeah, I mean, you know, I was pulling, I think, off of that little mining rig. I had 12, 30, 90s. That sounds right. It's been a while. But I think it was like 1,200 watts or something, you know, it's kind of just a small heater in the room. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but you're right. Yeah, it's, but maybe with the curve and development and resource demands, I mean, maybe as things become more efficient, that bottleneck won't be as bad. I don't know. But yeah, I, I see that 10 too. years to build a nuclear power plant. That's where. Right. Yeah. Right. We're not exactly yeah. adding supply. But anyway, I don't want to yeah. end on that yeah. note. Yeah. Uh, people can use Paradox today, right? 
Yeah, I encourage everyone to visit discoverparadox.com, P-A-R-A-D-O-C-S.com, discover, prefacing that, and sign up for the beta and updates. I'm not going to sell you anything, not going to bother you with an email unless it's an update. Hey, beta is about to launch. But as soon as the beta launches, you'll be able to create a free account and access the entire database. And again, there will be options after the beta and the public release. There'll be options for paid subscriptions relatively low to get you more features with the AI, more visualization tools, those kinds of things. But the database itself is and always will be free for anyone that wants to check it out. Yep. All right, my friend, any other final words? No, I appreciate you having me, Sean. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks to your audience for listening to me ramble on. Hopefully, yeah, if anybody has questions or would like to reach me, they certainly can email me at chase at paradoxproject.com. I know it's confusing to discover paradox and paradox project, but yeah, he's <laughs> just got to gotta deal with it. That's just one of those things. So. All right, yeah. Chase. It was an absolute pleasure, and I'm sure the audience will love learning all about this and checking out the site too. So I hope thank so. you again. Thanks so much, Sean. Thanks for having me. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe and also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now, and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything. third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you could get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and you can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel. And I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates Club. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of an expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me a Coffee, which is a separate site, and there's also you can go through YouTube with either a Super Chat, Super Sticker, or a Super Thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.